As all of you know, young and old, every day we're asked to make choices. Some are as simple as, do you want chocolate or vanilla ice cream for dessert? Or, do you want to go swimming or hiking today at camp? As we start to age, mature, choices become a little more difficult or challenging. As seniors in high school, do you want to go to college or do you want to get a job? As adults, you've interviewed for a new job and it has been offered. Do you go or do you stay? Or, as a husband and wife in a rocky marriage, do you try to work things out? That is part of today's gospel lesson. In verses 49 to 53, Jesus is talking to his disciples. And in the course of the discussion, Jesus admits that some people will follow him and some will not. He would like all to follow him, but he is realistic to know that that is not going to happen. The fire that Jesus mentions has to do with judgment, the day of judgment. He also wishes that judgment was happening now. Jesus is talking about people choosing or not to follow him, but he is also talking about what he knows the future holds for himself. Jesus is totally involved in his mission to save us. Fire is the image he uses to speak of his great desire in his heart. He knows that the people who reject Jesus reject God, and they will bring the fire of judgment upon themselves. Jesus is bearing God's judgment, not for his wrongdoings, but for the sins of others. According to commentaries, the baptism that Jesus mentions is not a literal one, but a metaphorical one. Remember, a metaphor is a comparison of two unlike things without using like or as. In this case, it is like being immersed, or overwhelmed, or plunging over your head into an experience. He knows what lies ahead and is willing to proceed. Of course, the completion he is talking about is his crucifixion. Every day, Jesus knew what was coming, but he still did what he was called to do. Heal the sick, feed the hungry, teach the people, proclaim the good news, nurture his disciples, talk to his father. He was to do all that his father wanted. As far as the division Jesus speaks, it is the choice of where does Jesus fit into, into the lives of the people. He speaks of the family unit. He is saying the family relationship must be secondary to following him. Love for Jesus must come first. Those who do not put him above all else will find their devotion to Christ risks division and even separation from families. Discipleship compels hard choices. He came to transform a sinful world, and that kind of transformation does not come easily. Jesus is usually associated with peace, but it never meant to be everyone agreeing or making everyone likable, or a life filled with harmony and no anger no division, no struggles. The road with Jesus will have trouble, trial, sadness, sacrifice, despair. There will also be joy, glory, and life eternal, and that will be in heaven. But in the here and now, there will be happiness but hardship, unity but division, a good road but not an easy road to follow. Jesus' message was hard but honest. Jesus does not try to cease division, but he does insist that we must put God first. No one who hears and considers his words could ever be misled about the cost of discipleship. At the same time, no one who hears and considers his words could ever doubt that there is another choice to make.
than surrendering to Him as Lord. No other life worth living than giving every day and every breath to Him. No other destiny worth pursuing than eternity in His presence. He is the only way. Jesus is committed to a difficult mission, but distressed at the anticipation of it, wishing that the waiting was over and the mission completed. It is what a candidate for surgery feels while waiting for the time to come, or as a team member waiting for a big game to begin, or being in the doctor's office waiting to hear your test results. We expect the trial to be bad, but the waiting is difficult too. In verses 54 to 56, these verses are directed to the multitudes following Jesus. Remember, he is speaking to a farming or rural people. A cloud rising in the west, originating over the Mediterranean Sea, promised rain. A south wind, originating in the desert, tells people to expect a scorcher. Farmers and shepherds knew how to read such signs. Such knowledge is key to their survival. They learned how to read the weather signs that are key to physical survival, but have not learned how to read signs of moments with potential to determine destinies or time that is key to spiritual survival. Today, we no longer know how to read weather signs. We get our weather forecast from the Weather Channel. The signs we're concerned about are political and economic. What will Congress do? Will stocks go up or down? How is the grain or livestock market doing? Can we find a way to predict the future so we can make the right bets? We are much like the people to whom Jesus was speaking because they too are interested in signs that would influence their economic future. We're also like the people to whom Jesus was speaking in that while we are interested in political and economic signs, we care little about the spiritual issues of the day. Examples. We see family disintegration and act as its apologist rather than seeking to promote family integrity. We see on television the poor of the world dying of starvation, but go to our dinner tables without considering how we might help. We hear stories of Christians being persecuted around the world and fail to remember that these are our brothers and sisters. We must not neglect to interpret the signs around us that serve to remind us to put our spiritual house in order. Let us not neglect reading, studying, and applying the truths of the Bible. Let us not neglect to come before our Heavenly Father in prayer. As stated in Matthew 6, 33, let us not fail to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Hopefully, this is not too much gloom and doom, but the road Jesus set forth for us to follow is not always going to be the yellow brick.